um, just a few places in the Bible, but probably the most lengthy part that I'm going to look at is, is just for a moment, at least, is out of Deuteronomy chapter 11. And so you can go ahead and find your place there. I want to just pray real quickly. Father, we love you. We thank you, Lord, for who you are. We pray, God, that you would speak to us powerfully uh, through your word. God, as we conclude our, our, our series here for the essential of obedience this morning, speak to us as only you can. We love you. We praise you. Bless our teachers that are leading our kids to learn about you more. I give you glory and honor. In Jesus' name, can we just say amen? Amen. amen. Two weeks ago, Pastor Matthew began by talking about the call to obedience. And he really talked about, in a very powerful way, how that God has the right to call us to obedience because he is first and foremost, he is our creator. He is the heavenly father, he is God almighty, and he is that omnipotent one. But he did not leave it just as God created, as a creator. He didn't demand obedience based upon his position as creator. He also earned it when he also became God our Redeemer when Jesus came and he died on the cross to demonstrate the fact that he loves us more than we can even understand. That's who God is. He's not only creator, but he is also God our Redeemer. So the call to obedience that we are being called to is not just positioned in him as creator God, it's also positioned in him as Redeemer God, the one who demonstrates that again and again. And out of that call... Out of that call based upon creation, out of that call based upon redeeming, Romans 12 tells us that our only response would be to surrender. We are to surrender to him based upon the fact that he's not only created God, but he is also redeemer God. He's died for our sins. In fact, Paul writing in Romans 12, but we didn't read this before. I'm going to read it today real quickly. I, I didn't tell you to turn there. Let me just read it for you. It says, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind that he will find acceptable, for this is truly the way that we worship him. We surrender to him based upon what he has done. What has he done? He created us and he has redeemed us. So we give ourselves to him. I, I like how the message translation puts this, and I love that it's just real easy to understand. It says, God helping you take your everyday ordinary life, you're sleeping, you're eating, you're going to work, you're walking around life, and just place it before God as an, as an offering, embracing what God does for you is the best thing that you can do for him. It's about surrender. Yeah. And again, it's not about just surrendering for the sake of surrendering, it's surrendering for the sake of relationship. Because that's what relationship, again, again, Matthew, Matthew said it, rules without relationship leads to rebellion. But when we have a genuine relationship with God because that's based in love, it changes everything because love always pushes us towards action. It propels us to do something. It compels us, love does, based in relationship to answer God's call to obedience. Last week I talked about the choice of obedience. God's having the right to call me to obedience based upon him as creator and redeemer doesn't mean that I just automatically make the choice. God still leaves it in my ballpark to choose him. Even though it should be the absolutely thing that I naturally do, I still have to be the one that's willing to do it. God does not force himself upon any person. I have to choose him. I have to make the choice whether I'm going to follow after him. But whatever I choose, here's the reality, whatever I choose, and this is not only spiritually but also physically in every aspect of life, Whatever we choose, we are going to have to be the ones that live with the choices we make. Amen. Amen. Can we just be truthful? We live with the choices we make. Whether we make a choice in haste, we make it in anger, we, we react somehow and we do something, the choice is still ours and we have to live with the consequences of that choice. That's true in the physical, but it's also true in the spiritual. We have to live with the choices we make no matter how we spin it. We talked about King Saul last week and how he tried to spin the choices he was making, but he still had to live with it. I choose to be like Joshua. We read out of Joshua last week, Joshua 24. He's an old man. He's standing in front of the children of Israel. He says, guys, make a choice. You can choose to, to follow the gods of the Egyptians where we used to live. You can choose to follow the false gods of the Amorites where we're now living. But I'm just going to tell you right now, I choose to follow the living God, the one who brought us out of Egypt, who delivered us, who worked signs and wonders amongst us. I choose to follow him. As for me and my house, Joshua said, we will serve the Lord. And that's the decision that I have made personally. That's the decision my wife has made, our family has made, that we as a family, we will serve the Lord. But it was our choice. My parents made their choice, but I still had to make my choice. It's a personal decision. I choose 
to follow him. I choose to serve the Lord. See, God gives all of us choice. It's called free will. Self-determination. Freedom. Autonomy. We choose for ourselves. It is a gift that God gives us. And it's a gift that's based in love. Why? Because forced love is not true love. God could have forced us to choose him, but that's not love. So God gives us the ability to choose. And by choosing, we demonstrate love for him. So we have a love relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ that's based in love. And it's a moment-by-moment -moment thing, day-by-day -day thing. Guess what? Nobody in this room is perfect. Amen. Nobody watching by Facebook Live is perfect. Not a single one of us that, that are here are perfect. And the moment you think you are, you've blown it already. Day by day, we don't always get it right. But if we are striving to get it right, guess what? If we are striving to get it right, guess what? We will. Because repentance always follows failure where love is present. And where that takes place, then we have reconciliation and we also have transformation. That's what happens where love is present. It's not always easy, but it is possible. I said last week that choice involves three things. It involves love, it involves trust, but it also involves relationship. And when we have those three things, guess what? We can follow Jesus. We can choose him. Which brings us finally to what we're talking about today. We've had the choice. We've had the call. And today I'm getting to talk about the crown or the reward of obedience. Can anybody say the crown of obedience? I like that, the crown. Just makes you think of something. So I'm having some royal hat on. It's a crown, of, the crown of obedience. Maybe I should say it this way, the reward of obedience. Anybody like rewards? Yes. Come on, anybody like rewards? Yes. Everybody should have lifted your hand. You didn't lift your hand. I mean, you're lying in church. <laughs> we lack rewards, right? I would love a reward. I used to eat a box of Cracker Jacks just to get the reward on the inside. I mean, it might, might have been just one little tiny little stick on tattoo, but guess what? It was a reward down on the inside, and I'd eat that whole bunch of caramel popcorn just to get down there, throw away the peanuts. I didn't want the peanut, but I wanted the, the pot, and I liked the prize. I used to go with my mom. We'd go to the grocery store, Minimax. Anybody remember the Minimax grocery store chain? And it's not around anymore, but when I grew up, Minimax down here in Texas, down here in South Texas, we'd go to Minimax. I would go with her just to the grocery store just so I could walk with her down the cereal aisle and tell her based upon the prizes on the box which one I thought I was hungry for. <laughs> Am I right? Yes. Why? Because we, we like a reward. We love the rewards. Parents reward their kids that they get straight A's in school. I never got too many of those. It's, just, it's, it's true. I, I do remember my third grade class. Isn't it amazing? No matter how old we get, we still remember certain things. I remember my third grade teacher in elementary school. Went to Grace Raymond Elementary down here in Aldean District. My third grade teacher's name was Miss Motoreski. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> she always said, what? Miss Motoreski. Don't ask us to spell it. I would have butchered it. But she was a sweet, precious lady. And... Uh, Every week, she gave out a weekly report card. Not, not the one that came out at the end of the quarter, but she, you got a weekly report card. And I loved it about her class because it was incentive, it was reward-based because if you got all the check marks for doing your work, if you got all the stars in the right place, if everything, the grades were all done, at the end of the week, Miss Motoreski would bring out candy bars. And you could turn in that report card for a candy bar. And every week when I finally got, I, when I got the chance, I'd, went, I'd walk up and I'd turn it in for one of those 12-inch long chocolate caramel candy bars. You know, they used to weave in each other like this. It was called a marathon bar. <laughs> Anybody remember those marathon bars? I know I'm kind of nostalgic today, but that's, you know. I'm going to tell you, for an 8-year-old third grader, there was no reward higher. It was awesome. We are reward driven. All of us are. Whether we're, we're in school and we're getting uh, somehow incentive from our parents to get a reward you know, by making straight A's or we actually have grown up and now we're working in a job and you may not call them rewards at your job but guess what they call them incentives? 
If you perform and you produce and you do this, you're going to get this bonus, you're going to get this incentive. And so guess what? We all are still with a mindset of working for a reward that if I do this and this is going to happen, if I do this and that's going to happen. It's true for school, it's true for business, it's true for now for restaurants, it's true for going shopping. I mean, you go and now that you get these points. I remember Debbie and the girls having this app. I think it was uh, Shop Kicks. Shop Kicks, was that it? Shop Kicks. I don't know if some of you ladies know what that is. Maybe you guys know what that is. I learned what it was because if you went to certain stores, you got certain points for just walking in the store. And if you got enough points, you would get a coupon for something. And it got to the point that we were driving around. Debbie would have us driving, the girls driving down this, you know, these strip centers that got like multiple stores. And, and it got to the point that they didn't even get out the car. They just rolled down the window, held their phone out the window, <laughs> driving around, just trying to see if the points would just register. And, and they would say, oh, it didn't happen. Fake another pass. And we take, <laughs> here we come again. I mean, it's like, and it's like, you know, we're, she's trying to get like 40,000 points. And I'm saying, what are we going to get if we get 40,000 points? Well, I'll get a $5 coupon. <laughs> I spent $200 in gas. <laughs> you, some of you, got, you know what I'm talking about. I, I'm just saying that rewards are a powerful motivator. Rewards are a powerful motivator. But here's the thing. I want you to listen to what I'm saying. I'm about to say. Here's the thing about rewards. Rewards in and of themselves are not enough to keep us motivated and passionate long term. Rewards or incentives, whatever you want to call it, as great as they are, they are not enough to keep us motivated or passionate long term. And that's the key word. In the short term, they excite us. We're driving by with a phone out the window. We're going to that restaurant all the time because we get so many points and get so many punches on our little car, we can get a hamburger for free. But it's not enough for long-term incentive right. to keep us passionate, to keep us moving forward. And here's the thing. What's true in the natural is also very much true in the spiritual. Yes, yes. You know, we read the Bible, the Scriptures, and at first glance, it seems like God, when we read the Word here, is He is trying to incentivize us to follow him, that, that there's somehow this reward-based philosophy that God is trying to tell us, if you'll just do this, then I'll do that. And then I'm reminded, rewards and incentives are not enough to keep us excited or passionate for the long term. I want us, I want us to really see what I'm, I'm talking about. Look in Deuteronomy 11. I told us to turn there. If you have your Bibles, whether it's paper form or digital form, let's look real quickly. Beginning at verse 1, it says, You must love the Lord your God and obey all of His requirements, decrees, regulations, and commands. This is Moses speaking. This is known as the Decalogue in, of, of, of the, in the Old Testament. Verse 2 says, Keep in mind that I am not talking now to your children who have never experienced the discipline of the Lord, your God, or seen his greatness in his strong hand and powerful arm. They didn't see the miraculous signs and wonders he performed in Egypt against Pharaoh and his land. They didn't see what the Lord did in the, to the armies of Egypt and their horses and chariots. Your children did not see how the Lord cared for you in the wilderness until you arrived here. Verse 7. But you have seen the Lord perform all of these mighty deeds with your own eyes. Therefore, be careful to obey every command I'm giving you today so you can have strength to go in, take over the land that you're about to enter. For if you obey, you will enjoy a long life in the land the Lord swore to give your ancestors. And to you, their descendants, a land flowing with milk and honey. Verse 13. If you carefully obey all the commands I am giving you today, and if you love the Lord your God and serve him with all of your heart and soul, then he will send rains in their proper seasons. He will give you lush pasture land for your livestock, and you will have all you need to eat for yourselves. Verse 16. 
But be careful, don't let your heart be deceived so that you turn away from the Lord and serve and worship other gods. If you do, the Lord's anger will burn against you. He will shut up the sky, hold back the rain. The ground will fail to produce its harvest. Verse 18, so commit yourself wholeheartedly to these words of mine. Tie them to your hands and wear them on your foreheads as a reminder. Teach them to your children. Talk about them when you're at home, when you're on the road, when you're going to bed, when you're getting up. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates so that as long as the sky remains above the earth and you and your children may flourish in the land the Lord swore to give your ancestors. Be careful to obey all these commands I'm giving you. Show love to the Lord your God by walking in his ways and holding tightly to him. I'll just pause and stop there. When you first read this in its entirety, it feels like God's motivator for getting to us to do something is slowly, solely based upon a reward. That it's somehow incentive laced. You do this and I'll do that. Do this and then I'm not going to do that. And it feels very much like an incentive. And let me just say this. There is some truth in the sense that blessings follow obedience but I can tell you right now, God understands better than any of us that rules without relationship always leads to rebellion. He understands that better than anybody. That's why the call to obedience and the choice of obedience and the reward of obedience is first and foremost anchored in the word that we've been using now for three weeks, that word relationship. A personal relationship that you and I have with Jesus Christ where we love him and we follow him and we serve him. Not because we're going to somehow get something in return. Not because it has somehow there's a reward in it. Not because it's incentivized and we're going to somehow gain something because of. No, simply because we have a relationship of love for him. We love him. You see, relationship says because I love you, I am going to do this for you. And that's actually what you have in Deuteronomy chapter 11. And you read it. You may not have seen it, but you actually read it. Verse 1. You must love the Lord your God and obey all of his requirements, decrees, regulations, and commands. If you carefully obey, verse 13... Uh, all the commands I'm giving you today, and if you love the Lord your God and serve him with all of your heart and soul. Verse 22, be careful to obey all these commands I'm giving you. Show love to the Lord your God by walking in his way. The key word in this whole passage here is that word, L-O-V-E, the word love. Everything stems from that love relationship. You must first love the Lord, and as you love him, the outgrowth of that or the overflow out of that will manifest itself into action. Again, where love exists, actions follow, which is the foundation of relationship. Where there is no love, where there is no action, there is no relationship. Just let that sink in. I was thinking about something that, that Matthew said a few weeks ago when he was talking about cleaning the house, him and his sisters cleaning the house while Debbie and I were out of town, knowing that uh, it was the only way that he could really show us, they could really show us how much they loved us. It's not that we didn't tell them, hey guys, keep the house clean. Because we did. Don't, don't burn it down. Don't tear it down. Keep the house clean. But what they did, what Matthew was talking about was this thought that they had. Hey, we want to show mom and dad really how much we love. We're going to go above and beyond. It's not just going to be about making sure that, you know, that all the stuff is underneath the bed and it's in the closet and put away. We're going to make sure that we do more. We're going to vacuum the house. We're going to dust the furniture. We're going to do everything that we see mom do all the time and, and dad do very rarely. We're going to do all of those things. <laughs> it's true. I just had to say that. It's true. We're going to do all of those things. That way when we mom and dad come home, it's just going to make them happy. And that's how we, we can show love. And I was thinking about what Matthew said. Because he was trying to imply that in doing that, that was the least that they could do in order to express how they felt for us. See, we had asked for them to do certain things, but their motivation was more than our mere asking. It was a desire to please based upon a relationship that we had with each other that was rooted in love. See, the point I'm just trying to make is simply this. The crown of obedience or the reward of obedience that we're trying to get, we're striving for, is not incentive-laced. Though God has some amazing incentives. No, it's a reward that's based in the fact that I have a love relationship with Christ. 
And out of that love for him, there is an overflow that I get. There's an overflow that I receive simply because I choose to show Jesus how much I love him. Do you follow me? Can, can I give you just a couple of rewards of obedience? There's, there's, there's so many. I can't give you a ton of them, but I, I'm going to give you three. Some of the rewards of obedience that we have. And, 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 and let me just add this one more thing before I even talk about that. When we, sometimes when we hear the word obedience, we think about a set of rules. That we just do these things and do these things, set of rules. That's, that's not God at all. That's a works-based righteousness. And God is not about works. There's not enough good things that anybody in this room can do to somehow even earn a small corner of heaven. So it's not about our works because the moment I start thinking it's about me following all the rules and getting all the rules right, I diminish who Jesus is and I diminish what he did for me on the cross. So it's not about my rules. Not about rules. The context that we're talking about is about relationship, a relationship that is based in who he is. And I can even say this. The word obedience in this context is, not, is more about faith and more about belief. If I have faith in him, and if I truly believe in him, then I will walk with him. Can I give you three real quickly? I got five minutes to give you three. I'll take 15. Here we go. First one is joy. Just joy. Just joy. Three-letter word, J-O-Y. Joy. Say that with me. Say joy. Joy is something that's deep. It's, 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 it's greater than what's on the surface. Joy is something that's way down on the inside. Listen, when we have a relationship with Jesus, when we're following him in faith, when we have believed on him as our Savior, obeying and trusting him as Lord, there's a joy that's on the inside that resonates within us, that goes beyond the circumstances of our everyday lives. And sometimes we have to hear that and know that. Because life is not always about being on the mountaintop. Sometimes that, that we, we find ourselves dipping down into the valley. Sometimes like Psalm 23, we're walking through the valley of the shadow of death. But guess what? When we're there, we can still have joy. Why? Because we know that the good shepherd is still with us. So we don't have to fear. Joy is something that goes even deeper. We used to sing a song around here that says, this joy that I have, the world didn't give it to me. And guess what? If the world didn't give it to me, the world can't take it away. Because it's not based in the circumstance. It is simply the outflow of the fact that I have a love relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. It's one of those rewards of obedience. It's one of those crowns of obedience that keeps us encouraged, that keeps us fighting the good fight, that keeps us staying strong and moving forward. It's a joy Based in a love relationship. John 15. I told you to look there earlier. John 15, verses 9 through 11. Jesus is in the upper room. He's talking to his disciples. This is just before the crucifixion. And he says to them, verse 9, I have loved you even as the Father has loved me. Remain in my love. And when you obey my commandments, you remain in my love. Just as I obey my Father's commandments and remain in his love. And then he says, I have told you these things so that you will be filled with joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. He's talking about joy literally hours before his own crucifixion. Literally before the disciples are about to be scattered. He's still talking about joy. Joy that is based in a love relationship. But listen, deep abiding joy is a reward for our faith and a reward for our belief. Our belief. It is the evidence of obedience that is established by relationship. Listen, I may not always be happy in some things. And I'll be honest, I, there's a lot of times I'm not happy. I get aggravated. Anybody ever gotten aggravated? I get aggravated even sometimes on a Sunday morning. And that's the worst time for me to get aggravated. But it can happen. It does. It can happen. Driving down the road and there's nobody on the road when I come and getting stuck at every red light. I got to be honest with you. That's an aggravation. For me, because I'm sitting at the red light looking around thinking, why am I sitting here? There's nobody on the road but me. And you're thinking, do I just go? Do I just go? That's just me. 
Listen, I may not be happy always in my circumstances, but understand the joy of Christ on the inside of me when I'm walking in relationship with him is not determined by what's going on around me. It's determined about who's living on the inside of me. So no matter what is happening, no matter how aggravated or frustrated I can be, I can still sit down at the end of the day and know that the joy of the Lord is still my strength. Because why? Because I abide in him and he abides in me. Debbie and I were recently, when we were in Amsterdam, we went over to uh, Harlem. We took a train, went to Harlem. Harlem, Am Harlem, Netherlands. Went to the home of Corey Ten Boom. A lot of you may know that name. Some of you may not. There's a book that used to be required reading in high schools in America called The Hiding Place. The story about Corey Ten Boom, who was a Dutch lady. Her family were, were uh, uh, watchmakers, clockmakers who loved Jesus with all their hearts, and, and, and they loved people in general, and they loved the Jewish people. So when the Nazis had taken over Holland, they began to try to uh, help people get to safe places. Their house, where they were at, and we went to the home, actual home. It, it was one block from the Gestapo headquarters here, one block from the police headquarters over here. And yet, because of their faith, they just wanted to help. And so they literally helped hundreds of Jews who came to their place they hid them there. They built the room in Corey's bedroom. It was a solid brick wall hiding place that they could get in. And, and they practiced in 70 seconds. They could ring a bell. They could get into the hiding place. Literally, it was only about two feet wide, maybe about eight feet long. And they would stand there sometimes for 48 hours inside this little place while the Nazis were inside trying to see if they could find anybody. They never found the hiding place. Corey, her mother, I mean her sister Betsy and her father end up getting arrested because a Gestapo agent came. They knew they were helping, but they didn't know how. Came and says, uh, said, you know, my wife's been taken by the police. You, know, can you, you can help me out some money. I know somebody, we can get her out. So the, they said, come back in a few hours. And Betsy gave some money, which was Corey's older sister, and they arrested him for that. They sent him to a camp. Then after... The invasion of Normandy, D-Day, they sent them to another concentration camp called Ravensbrück. I won't go through all the story. God helped Betsy smuggle a Bible into the camp. She put it underneath her dress, and, and when they were checking, patting everybody down, all of a sudden the guard got distracted, and she got to walk straight on into the camp with her Bible. But here's what I was going to tell you. Talking about the joy. In their barrack that they lived, Betsy and Corey, there was so many fleas, and so many lice living in there that the Nazi guards refused to go inside. They wouldn't go inside because it was that infested. Think about that. So infested that they were afraid to go in because they would attack and bite them so quick. So they literally stayed outside. And Betsy, she says to her sister, Corey, she says, Corey, praise God for the vermin. Because now... We can have Bible studies inside without worrying about being disturbed. You talk about a joy. When's the last time we praised God for vermin? You know what I'm saying? I'm talking about a joy that on the inside of us that says to us, as long as I have Jesus, as long as I have Christ, it doesn't matter literally what's going on around me. He is enough. Praise God for the vermin. Praise God for the circumstance. Praise God for whatever is happening. I still have joy because I still have Jesus. It is one of the crown of obedience when we walk and follow after him in fellowship and reunion and in love. We have joy that just keeps on growing. Psalm 1611, you will show me the way of life, granting me the joy of your presence. Second one, second one, fulfillment. Fulfillment. Psalms 37, 4 says, take delight in the Lord, and he will give you your heart's desires. King James says, delight yourself also in the Lord, he will give you the desires of your heart. A lot of people read that scripture and think that that somehow means that if we just love Jesus, he'll give us what we want. Right. As if, you know, we break it right out this big long wish list and give it to Santa Claus, it's going to happen. That's not what this scripture is saying at all. Take the light of the Lord and he will give you your heart's desires. What he's saying is this. When we walk in obedience with him, we've answered the call, we've made the choice, and now we're walking in a love relationship with Jesus. The desires he places inside of us are his desires from the beginning. It's not where we're trying to think of something I want to wish for. No, no. God purposely puts in us the desires that he wants us to have. 
so that we can find fulfillment and purpose in following after him. Understanding that wherever God has taken us in life, whatever God's birthed in us, whatever kind of career that is, God has only placed us there for the saving of lives and seeing his kingdom glorified. I love that. In other words, God is in the business of using us and using us in such a way that we have fulfillment in our lives. Think about that. I love the story in Luke chapter 10. Jesus has sent out the disciples, 72 of them. They all come back. When they come back, man, they're so excited. They're telling Jesus, oh, man, Jesus, we did this in your name. We did that in your name. We cast out demons. We, you know, we saw people heal. We did all kinds of crazy, amazing stuff, Jesus, in your name. And Jesus is just trying to keep their feet on the ground. He tells them, hey, guys, I know that's exciting, but just rejoice that your name's in heaven. But I love the fact that they're rejoicing. What are they rejoicing over? The fact that God used them. They found fulfillment and purpose in the reality that God used them. And here's the truth. No matter what you do for a living, no matter what your career is, whether you work outside the home or in the home, here's the reality. God can use you and you can have that same kind of purpose and fulfillment as God uses you. It is the outgrowth of a life of obedience that we have the joy of being used. And I got to tell you, there's nothing like it. There's nothing like leading somebody to the Lord. There's nothing like meeting somebody and just encouraging them. There's nothing like just having a conversation with somebody you never know and say, can I just pray for you? I just feel like I should pray for you. And then when you walk away, man, all of a sudden, like, whoa, that is awesome. That is a high you can't get nowhere. No alcohol, no drug, no nothing can give you that kind of a high when you actually have been used of God in purposes he's called you to. I love the story that Pastor Jim Cimbala shares. He's a pastor of the Brooklyn Tabernacle Church in New York. Phenomenal, powerful church, worldwide impact. But he tells the story about sitting down and, with, with, and, and speaking to Ravi Zacharias. And Ravi Zacharias is a world-renowned apologist, speaker who travels all over the world, phenomenal man of God. And uh, he, was, he was born in India. As a teenager, he tried to commit suicide. Somebody gave him a Bible in the hospital. He gave his life to the Lord, and God has used him ever since. Amen. But Ravi was telling him, Jim Simula, that he had had so many back surgeries on his back that he was having so much pain that sometimes when he walked up to the podium, he had to lean down because he was in so much pain. And then he told him that he would, had taken a trip. I believe he had gone overseas somewhere. And as he was overseas, one of his friends had contacted him and said, I know you're here. I'd love to meet with you. God spoke to me last night about 4 in the morning. I want to speak with you. I want to talk to you. God gave me two things to share with you. Ravi says, I'm really busy, but maybe we can meet for lunch in just a few minutes. So they met together. So they're having lunch, and this friend looks at Ravi and says to Ravi, he says, God told me to tell you two things. The first thing he told me to tell you is this. God's going to enlarge your ministry. He's going to give you a greater anointing than you've ever had. And uh, he says, he wants you to know that. He's going to enlarge your ministry and give you a greater anointing, use you greater than you've ever been used. He says, now the second thing he told me to tell you, he says, it doesn't make sense to me, but maybe you'll understand it. Just, I'm just going to tell you the second thing he told me to tell you. This is what it is. Three, four, five. Three, four, five. Ravi says... What'd you say? He says, God told me to tell you two things. First thing, he was going to enlarge your ministry and give you a greater anointing than you ever had. And then the second thing, three, four, five. Ravi, talking to the pastor, Jim Simbola, said, ever since I had that conversation with that man, he says, our ministry has been used in greater ways. I've felt that and I've sensed that. We've had a greater anointing. More doors have been opened to us. He says, but the second thing that he said, what this man didn't realize when he said it, he says, all the problems in my back were because of L3, L4, and L5. And he says, and since he had that conversation with me, I haven't had another pain in my back. Listen, all I'm saying... All I'm saying is that that man would have never reached out. He would not have stepped out in obedience. They would have never had that conversation. That would have never happened. He would have never had that fulfillment knowing that God used him. Guess what? You and I have the same opportunity to be used of God. It can be just talking to somebody, just encouraging somebody, praying with somebody. The point I'm saying is that there is a reward in just saying, God, I will be obedient unto you. He will give us a fulfillment that's beyond anything else that we can ever experience in this life. There's joy. There's fulfillment. And I'm going to close this down. There's completion. There's completion. You know what completion is? Completion is getting to the end of the race and hearing Jesus say two words. Well done. And when he says well done, that doesn't mean that the steak's been cooked too long. 
When he says, well done, he's saying, you did it. You made it. Awesome job. Awesome job. Well done. You see, serving Christ is, has some incentives, but I don't serve him because of the incentives. It's just the outgrowth and the overflow of the reality that I have a love relationship with him. But because I do, he fills me with joy. He gives me fulfillment. And one day I will walk the streets of gold. One day I will forever be in God's presence. One day I will have the ultimate completion to hear Jesus say to me, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Timothy, 2 Timothy 4, Apostle Paul, Pastor Steve, come. He says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have remained faithful. And now the prize awaits me. The reward awaits me. The crown of righteousness. The crown of faithfulness. The crown of belief. Which the Lord, the righteous just will give me on the day of his return. And guess what? And the prize, Paul says, is not just for me, but for everyone who looks forward to his appearing, or everybody that loves him and follows after him. There's a reward at the end of this thing, friends. There's a completion that'll be like none other, forever in his presence, and to enjoy everything that God has in store for us. So answering the call of obedience and choosing and making the right choice of obedience and gaining the rewards of obedience, joy, fulfillment, completion, and there's a zillion others that we could add It's all through relationship. I know this. When it's all said and done, Jesus is worth it. Jesus is worth it. He's worth it. He's worth it. He's worth everything that I give. Because guess what? As much as I give, he's already given me more. He's worth it all. I, I, I got to close. John Piper says, our obedience is God's pleasure when it proves that God is our treasure. Our obedience is God's pleasure when it proves that God is our treasure. Is God your treasure? Then follow him with faith. Follow him with belief. Trust him. You're not going to always get it right. I don't always get it right. But I know whose hand I'm holding. And because I'm holding his hand, the overflow of that relationship is I have a joy. I find fulfillment. And one day, he's going to say, well done. And it's going to be worth it all. Father, thank you today, Jesus. Thank you today, Jesus, for who you are. God, I'm so grateful to you. All that you've given for us. Lord, some of us here are still debating the call, pondering the choice, not yet receiving the reward. But I pray that, Lord, that we would take the moment, the time to really contemplate who you are because everything that we're talking about the following after you Lord is, is, is based in love there is a love relationship that we have with you so it's not about rules it's not about do's and don'ts it's about do I genuinely love you with all of my heart and I know this, if I genuinely love you, actions follow. And I will choose to honor you with my life because of a love relationship I have. Would you stand together all over this room? I've asked this multiple times, but I'll ask it again today. How many have a desire to follow Jesus. Do you have a desire to follow Jesus? I tell you, that's my longing in my life 
There used to be a bumper sticker that says, who who dies with the most toys still dies. But he who dies with Jesus inherits everything. Well done. I want to hear him say, well done. God, just fill me with your joy. God, let me find fulfillment and purpose in in being used by you wherever I'm at. And God, help me follow you well. So you say the crowning thing in my life. Well done. Anybody here just need prayer today? Would you lift your hand? Anybody just need prayer today? Lift your hand. Whatever it could be. It could be spiritual, physical. I want to pray for you that I'm open up these altars. Father, I pray right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, you know our hearts today. You know our lives. You know where we all are at. God, some of us have lifted a hand and we're saying, I have a spiritual need. I'm, maybe I've not answered the call. I'm wanting to. I've not made the choice, but I want to. I pray right now that even as I pray, Lord, that they are praying in their heart because it's not about my prayer, it's about their prayer. And saying, Jesus, I choose you. Your will over mine your ways over mine. I follow you. Forgive us, redeem us, wash us, cleanse us. I'm yours forever. I follow you. I pray that there's people praying that prayer right now. Lord, there's some that may be just struggling. Maybe their joy is lacking. Maybe they haven't had enough confidence in themselves and who you are in their lives to be bold enough to step out in faith and be used. I just pray, Lord, that you'd fill them with all boldness, And show them opportunities, God, whether it's at work, with a friend, at the Walmart, at the bank, wherever. Give them opportunity just to share you. Pray with somebody. Encourage somebody. And then I pray, God, for all of us that we will walk with you well, honoring you with our lives. Not because we're trying to follow a rule, but because we have a relationship with the Lord that loves us. And because we love him, we follow you. I pray this in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. 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 I want to open up the altars. I want us to find a place of prayer. If you can take the moment in time. I know I'm late. And if you must go, please, I understand that. But these altars are open. I want to invite us. If you have the time, can take the time to find a place of prayer. God bless you. We love you. Amen. Oh, to Jesus, I surrender.